Hello, everyone. Welcome. Let's get started. So nice to be here with you all again for the second week of the seminar. I know that the quarter is off and running, but this is still just our second time being together. So I'm really glad to see you all for the uh, week two of Urban Food Systems, which is the Food Systems, Nutrition, and Health Seminar this quarter. Before I turn the floor over to our wonderful guest today, I just wanted to make a couple of acknowledgements and announcements. So hopefully most of you heard that yesterday was the, as of last year, federally recognized Indigenous Peoples Day. And this is really important because this is a very new national holiday, even though it has been recognized and celebrated for decades and beyond. Um, by Native communities, by supporters and allies, and since 1990 by, uh, I think it's South Dakota, um, and then it has since spread uh, throughout states and cities and now across the country. So yesterday was a day to celebrate and honor the First Nations of this land, uh, the Native Americans of uh, the regions all over the states, and then reminding, uh, reminding ourselves also that anywhere we are in the world is, of course, native land. And so on the first day of the seminar, I shared with you the native-land.ca website where you can look up whose native land you're on anywhere in the world. As we delve into week two, I just want to um, offer a couple of reminders and also a welcome to those of you who have joined the class since our first seminar last week. Thank you so much for your interest. It's really exciting that there's a growing energy around urban food systems and that you're all part of it. So it's really great to have you here. If you did miss week one, please spend some time on Canvas where you'll find the recording from the first lecture and you'll also find the syllabus and all the details about the course overview and the assignments, et cetera. And so the first assignment for the Nutrition 400 students will be due this Friday. Um, and that is the first opportunity to submit a seminar summary. The details are on Canvas under Module 2 and in the syllabus. And please reach out to Mara Zinnen or myself on Canvas if you have any questions. So last week, we started off with a poll everywhere. There aren't going to be poll everywheres this week. Um, this is just a reminder of what you shared in the first week. And um, this, the question that was put out to the class was, you know, share your interests about urban food systems. What is it about urban food systems that drew you to this class beyond the one credit that some of you may have just needed to fill a gap, okay? But what about urban food systems is really, uh, engaging and interesting to you. And what you'll see at the center, just as a reminder for those of you who contributed and uh, getting up to speed for those of you who have just joined, that at the center of our collective interest was a focus on sustainability and probably more broadly sustainable food systems. With food and nutrition really being at the center, food access being at the core, right, with an emphasis on health, equity, community, and resources. And so I actually, I, was, I just wanted to draw our attention back to here, to this uh, collective word cloud that we created last week, and say that I think, I feel pretty confident that through the quarter, we're actually gonna work through all of these interests. And I'm really thrilled about the speaker that we have who's joining us today, who will be joining us by Zoom, because Dr. Jesse Jones Smith really works at this intersection at the real center of your interests here. So Dr. Jones Smith, I think you can hear me. Um, so you are speaking exactly to what students are interested in in this class. Um, the intersection of sustainability, nutrition, food, equity, access, and community resources. Uh, so with that, I'm so thrilled to introduce our speaker who will be uh, talking about the sweetened beverage taxes here in Seattle, and specifically about the economic burdens and benefits. And so Dr. Jesse Jones Smith is an associate professor in nutritional sciences, as well as in uh, health systems and population health and epidemiology, all within the School of Public Health. And she investigates socioeconomic causes and correlates 
correlates of obesity risk in both high and low middle income countries. Past and current research pertains to income and ethnicity based health disparities in obesity, early life risk factors for obesity, and the nutrition transition and increasing obesity prevalence in low and middle income countries. So with that, let's give a real warm welcome to our virtual guest of Dr. Jesse Jones Smith. Um, and I will get her up to speed here. Mara, I might ask for your help. <laughs> there you are. Hello, Jesse. Thank you so Hello. much for being here. And whenever you're ready, you can share your screen and the floor is yours. Great, all right, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you for having me in your classroom. Um, and I'm sorry that I could not be there in person. Um, I'm actually in Southern California right now. So um, I'm not just sitting in my, in my room um, further away in Seattle. Um, but thank you for having me. And um, Yona, it was great to um, hear that introduction for what the, the class is interested in. I hope that I can deliver some content of interest that touches on multiple aspects of uh, what folks are interested in. So um, as uh, uh, Yona said, I'm going to be talking about um, sweetened beverage taxes in general, but also more specifically about a study that um, I've been working on for the past few years that examines uh, economic benefits and burdens of sweetened beverage taxes according to household income and also po city population level income. Um, in terms of you know, questions, if there are questions that come up that are clarifying or feel really important not to just blow through, feel free to interrupt me. I'm happy to stop and clarify um, or answer questions along the way. But if I don't, um, if I don't hear anything, I'll just you know, continue to breeze through so that we hopefully have time at the end for questions. Um, okay, so um, I'm in terms of an outline for today's talk, I'm going to start off talking about um, uh, sugar sweetened beverage taxes in general, providing some rationale for these taxes and a little bit of background about them. Um, then I'm going to spend some time talking about the details of this particular study, our study design and our methods, and then we'll end up looking at the results of this study about the economic burdens and benefits of um, sweetened beverage taxes. So starting out, just some context for sweetened beverage taxes. Um, first, you know, it, it's important to recognize that uh, sugar sweetened beverage taxes are just one policy that are aimed at changing the financial incentives and disincentives in our food supply. Um, the food supply that we sort of all encounter in the U.S. and in countries around the world is one that really is abundant in ultra-processed foods. Um, and these ultra-processed foods are sort of important for the public's health because they've been associated with increased risk for chronic disease um, and particularly chronic diseases that are the leading causes of death and disability in the U.S. and in many countries around the world, such as heart disease, hypertension, cerebrovascular disease, um, diabetes, et cetera. Um, additionally, these ultra processed foods tend to be priced such that they are uh, relatively cheaper than um, less processed foods, foods that are more um, whole foods and tend to be healthier for us or represent kind of a higher quality of diet. Um, in addition to these ultra processed foods being kind of cheaper in terms of just the, the price that we pay at the register, um, they also uh, represent sort of savings in terms of time costs. So these foods are already somewhat processed, so they tend to take, you know, less time to prepare. Um, they're manufactured to appeal to our tastes, so they're also sort of tasty and convenient. Um, and so our current food system is set up so that we're really you know, incentivized and compelled to be able to access and consume these sort of ultra processed foods more readily um, and accessibly than we are to be able to consume the sort of less processed whole and um, tending to be healthier foods. Um, and on top of that, the, you know, the food industry is, um, 
has very little incentive really to change the way that our food supply and our food system looks. And so it, it instead falls on citizens, um, advocates, uh, public health practitioners and researchers, medical scientists to try to devise ways for making our current food system and our current food environment, um, it, making it easier for all of us to actually be able to choose a diet of high nutritional quality um, in the food system that we're operating in. So making changes to this food environment to make that easier for everybody. Um, and certainly this will require um, many small actions and probably also many large actions to change pieces, elements of the food system, elements of the food environment, so that we all are having an easier time having a high quality, um, a high quality diet and, um, and therefore being able to live sort of um, healthier, longer lives. Um, in that context, sugar sweetened beverages are just one policy option that have been pursued to this end. Um, and sugar sweetened beverages, uh, beverage taxes, excuse me, have been passed in uh, seven cities in the US, um, shown on the map here in little red dots, um, but also in 50 countries around the world. So um, these taxes have really proliferated more worldwide than they have in the US, um, with the first tax at a country level passing in Mexico in uh, 2014, and uh, countries sort of continuing to um, add taxes kind of on a, a monthly and yearly basis, more countries uh, joining this list of having sugar sweetened beverage taxes. So the goal of these taxes is really twofold. Um, most of these taxes are formulated to achieve a goal of potentially reducing population consumption of SSBs, which stands for sugar sweetened beverages. Um, but they have a second goal, which is also to raise tax revenues. Um, and often these tax revenues are funneled into programs that are additionally aimed at um, making it easier for people to live healthier lives um, or improving the public's health. Um, and so that's sort of the overarching goals of these taxes. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about um, why, you know, sugar sweetened beverage taxes has sort of risen to the top in terms of um, nutrition policies uh, actively being pursued around the world and in the U.S. You know, why might we focus on taxing sugary beverages when certainly sugary beverages are not, you know, the only food contributing to this, you know, high degree of ultra processed uh, foods in our diet um, or um, overall low diet quality. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons why um, we might target sugary beverages with, with taxes is because, you know, in this food environment that we're living in, um, we have a food supply with excessive sugar. So um, this results in um, people consuming on average a much higher level of added sugar than is currently recommended by the dietary guidelines. Um, so this graph on the right gives a little um, summary of the recommended amount of added sugar shown in the green line, and then the um, average daily consumption of added sugar shown in the yellow dots. So the important point being that um, on average, Americans are exceeding this recommendation um, and oftentimes exceeding it by a lot for added sugar. Um, and consuming added sugar is what's called sort of, or added sugar is called the nutrient of concern because um, when we eat diets that are high in excess sugar, we have a higher propensity for consuming um, more calories than our body needs and consuming more calories than our body needs is associated with detrimental health conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, uh, stroke, high blood pressure, kidney disease, and cancer, and all of these conditions um, sort of accumulate to lead to uh, premature mortality um, and um, excess sort of morbidity or um, illness in, in the population. So this is why sugar, added sugar, is a nutrient of concern. Um, so, but why target sugary drinks? Because certainly there are, you know, um, many foods, uh, 
with added sugar in the food supply. Um, but sugary drinks have sort of been singled out um, for Target with these taxes for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that sugary drinks are actually the largest single contributor to added sugar intake in the U.S. Um, a second reason is that many of these drinks um, provide added sugar, but they don't provide any beneficial nutrients um, in addition to the sugar. So they're kind of like a low hanging fruit in terms of an ultra processed food to target for uh, taxation in that they provide something that is negative for our health without providing anything really beneficial for our health to a large degree. Um, and then finally, it seems that people respond to changes in the price of these sugary beverages. So even before places were pursuing explicit taxes on sugary beverages, um, economists had noticed that uh, through natural price fluctuations in the prices of sugary beverages, that people tend to respond to the to a price change in these beverages. So, you know, this is kind of a, a law of economics that when the price of something goes up, we tend to consume less of it. But when we get to areas of food, a lot of times, um, because foods are staples, um, the, we, we tend to shift around other things in our, our diet in order to not change the, the foods or beverages that we're consuming. But instead, with sugar-sweetened beverages, um, when the price goes up, people actually consume less. This indicates that people are price sensitive to um, the price of sugar-sweetened beverages and that they're not a staple in our diet, but rather something that is um, you know, more of a uh, disposable piece of our diet. Um, now, after sugar-sweetened beverages have been passed, it provides a really good opportunity to see, you know, whether when populations experience kind of an explicit increase in the price of these sugar beverages, whether they um, uh, buy less of them. And what we've seen so far in a couple good evaluations of uh, taxes around um, the US um, and around other countries, Mexico in particular, um, is that people actually really do respond to these taxes. So what I'm showing you here is just um, some uh, one depiction of the results from a sugar sweetened beverage tax in Philadelphia. Um, and so what you're looking at in the orange line um, is the volume of taxed beverages consumed in Philadelphia in approximately a year before Philadelphia passed their sweetened beverage tax. Um, and then the dotted vertical line is the date when Philadelphia passed a tax. And what you can really simply see is that the purchasing of these tax beverages drops off rather dramatically. Um, and when the researchers of this study kind of put this through a rigorous statistical analysis on net, they find that there was a 38% reduction in the purchasing of tax beverages in Philadelphia above and beyond changes that occurred in um, a nearby kind of pretty well demographically matched city of Baltimore. Um, so this is our first sort of indication that um, people are actually responsive to attacks on sugary beverages in Philadelphia. Um, in Seattle, there have been uh, similar findings, um, and this is kind of a cartoon picture uh, that summarizes some of the results um, that you read more about in, the, in one of the articles um, for today. But in Seattle, what's been found is that after Seattle passed its sugary beverage tax, um, there was actually a 22% reduction in the purchasing of tax beverages in Seattle as compared to uh, the, the change in purchasing of these same beverages in Portland, which kind of stands in for um, a comparison city. So these taxes, so in, you know, the, the point of this is just to say that these taxes do seem to um, be effective at reducing purchasing of tax beverages. Um, so just to kind of recap what we, the background we've been through so far, um, these taxes have been pursued as one policy option to um, attempt to create healthier food supplies for populations by changing incentives. Um, and that these seem to be effective at reducing the purchasing of these sugary beverages. Um, however, um, this kind of brings us more to the meat uh, that 
motivates um, the, the current uh, study that I'm going to tell you more about, um, there are, of course, kind of health and economic uh, equity considerations that come along with these taxes. Um, so in particular, um, a sugar sweetened beverage tax, the way they've been implemented in the U.S. and um, a lot of places around the world is as an ex excise tax. And this means that um, it is priced according to ounces of sugary beverage sold. So in Seattle, for example, the tax is implemented as being 1.75 cents per ounce of sugary beverage. Um, so you know, beverages that have over a certain amount of sugar um, and uh, are fall into kind of the taxed category in Seattle um, are subject to a 1.75 cent per ounce. This amount of tax that people pay does not vary by how much income you make. And so any tax like this um, has the potential to be uh, potentially economically regressive. Um, and so just to kind of make this concrete, um, the, the tax doesn't vary by income. So say we have a, a person with a lower income of $30,000 per year and a person of a higher income with $100,000 per year. If each of these people consume a thousand ounces of um, sugar sweetened beverages um, per year, they would both end up paying $17.50 per year. So they're paying the same, what I'll call the absolute amount of the tax. And we can argue about whether this is a small amount of dollars or a large amount of dollars. But nevertheless, because they have different incomes, this $18 or $17.50 is a larger proportion of the salary for the person who makes $30,000 than it is uh, the proportion of the salary for the person who makes $100,000. Um, so in this way, you know, people with lower um, incomes will end up paying a higher proportion of their salary towards a tax like this if, um, if the consumption of these beverages is the same across income. However, um, due to, you know, sort of the confluence of uh, inequitable, unjust, economic, um, political, environmental, and food system factors, um, the consumption of these beverages tends to um, be higher for populations with lower income or for BIPOC, uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of, of color. Um, so we might be in a situation where um, individuals in these populations actually consume more sugar-sweetened beverages and therefore are even more burdened by a tax like this. Um, so it's really um, important to, we thought it was really important to quantify the degree to which this tax is um, potentially being paid more so by individuals with lower incomes um, or communities of color compared to individuals with higher incomes um, or white communities. Um, so the implication is that, and I kind of already said this, but um, if the tax doesn't actually change consumption to a greater degree for people who are consuming more, and if that consumption is correlated with income or um, race or ethnicity, then we have potential for you know a uh, regressive a tax that is maybe potentially more regressive um, than public health advocates or citizens would prefer it to be. Um, so it's really important to kind of investigate empirically the degree to which is, this is regressive. Now, on the other hand, um, these taxes actually have, it's other folks have argued that these taxes have potential to be progressive in their health equity impacts. This is because if the tax actually does result in a greater decrease in consumption for people who have higher levels of consumption, then those same populations who have high levels of consumption actually may experience the greatest health, health gains from a tax like this. Um, in addition, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to kind of think about the tax policy as a whole and those tax revenues that are raised as a result of this policy. So um, many times, as I mentioned, the tax revenues that are raised are 
targeted towards health promoting programs. And often these programs may be um, explicitly uh, only available to uh, lower income populations or communities of color or targeted specifically towards um, these populations in attempt to um, provide additional resources that might be helpful in uh, correcting some of the inequitable and unjust exposures that we touched on on the other on the on the previous slide. Um, so, in essence, you know, the question is: Can the way that the tax revenues are spent offset any potential regressive aspects um, that might be associated with these taxes? And to kind of make this concrete. Um, in Philadelphia, for example, all of the tax revenue um, is being spent on um, attempting to improve kind of upstream social determinants of health. So improvements in neighborhoods and improvements in schools that might go on to have lifelong impacts um, for chronic disease risk. Um, in Seattle, the tax is revenue, which I'll talk more about at the end of the study, but or at the end of the presentation, has been spent on um, improving food access for populations with uh, lower incomes, and in some cases on improving access, again, to early education and other uh, social determinants of health. So what did our study, what did we study in our um, study and how do we do it? I'm gonna kind of give you a high level overview of um, what we did. So first, our research questions, um, we had two of them. We wanted to uh, first empirically test whether after a tax, um, lower income populations spent more on the actual tax than did higher income populations, and if so, how much more? Um, and then our second research question was about this sort of aggregate level of spending on tax revenues. So at a city population level wide, um, does the lower income population in a city spend more in tax, contribute more to tax revenues than they might get back in programs targeted towards, um, towards their population? Um, or uh, does a higher income population spend more on tax revenues than, than that population gets back in programming um, towards targeted, un, not targeted towards lower income populations? So this is what the questions we set out to answer. Um, we did so uh, through uh, a variety of data sources. So for the first part of our study, we um, used data that was a, um, a combination of two data sources that followed um, households longitudinally for a year. And these households tracked every single purchase of food and beverage that they made at a grocery store or a convenience store. Um, so from this data source, we uh, analyze the data from three cities with sugar sweetened beverage taxes, Philadelphia, Seattle, and San Francisco. Um, from here, we isolated all the purchases that were beverages, and then we um, classified these beverages as either taxed or untaxed in each city where they were purchased. We then, for each household, summed up uh, the volume of taxed beverages that they purchased, and then we calculated the um, total amount of money that that household would have spent on the tax in that city. Um, then just to account for the fact that households are of different sizes, we divided this by the number of people in a household. Um, a second thing we did with this spending on the tax was we calculated um, as a proportion of income, how much each household spent on a tax. And then we examined did this differ by household income category? So we use a measure of income that is called the a percent of the federal poverty level, where basically we're benchmarking people's income to um, what the federal government considers uh, the poverty line. So say for a family of three, the federal government might say that if your income is less than $23,000 a year, that that would classify you as living in poverty. Um, so we calculate people's income as a percentage of that level. So if you were making $46,000 a year, your income would be called 200% of the federal poverty line. And then you can see the categories that we used here for um, categorizing people into lower, middle, and higher income um, categories for the sake of our analysis. Um, 
For the second part of the study, we're really interested in that aggregate level, what happens to the tax revenues. So at a city level, when we think about you know, how many people in a city have lower incomes versus higher incomes, and what is the average amount of tax paid, do we find then that at an aggregate level that populations with lower incomes are um, paying more into the tax or, or not um, compared to those with higher incomes? Um, so here, we multiply the mean spending by income level by the number of people um, with uh, in each income category in each city. So simple example, if the mean level of spending on the tax is $10 each for a lower income population and there's 100,000 people in a city with lower incomes, then we multiply 10 by 100,000 and we would calculate that um, people with lower incomes contributed a million dollars in tax revenues for that city in that scenario. Um, next, for this part of the revenue equation, we wanted to figure out how much, how the tax revenue was being spent and how much of the tax revenue was being targeted towards populations with lower incomes. Uh, to do this, we had to do a lot of digging through city um, documents and contacting city officials in all three of these cities until we received a complete list of all the programs that were funded by the tax um, and how much money each program uh, received, and then we figured out whether there was pro there was an eligibility requirement for these programs. So if a program was only available to people with incomes less than 200% of the poverty line, then um, we considered that program as being targeted towards um, lower income populations. So again, I have a little example that I'm uh, I'm showing you here to kind of try to make it clear how we um, classified um, the program spending. So if we had two programs, each with a million dollar budget, and one had an eligibility criteria where they only um, allowed people to participate in their program if they met a certain income threshold, um, then in that program, we would count all you know, $1 million as being targeted towards populations with lower incomes. Whereas if we had a second program, and they had no income eligibility requirement, but um, when they looked at the demographics of who was served, it turned out that 60% of the people who were served actually had lower incomes. Then we would count 60% of that $1 million or $600,000 as being targeted towards populations with lower incomes. And then we added up the total across all programs to figure out of the total revenue, how much of it was targeted towards um, populations with lower incomes. Um, finally, we calculate what we call a net transfer. We're comparing the amount of tax paid by um, populations with lower incomes to the amount of tax that is going to, to programs targeted towards populations with lower incomes. Um, in the previous example, this would equal 600,000 being targeted towards um, populations with 600,000 being targeted as a net transfer, which is the amount above and beyond what um, the lower income population in this hypothetical example paid, but is coming back in programs targeted towards lower income populations. Um, so, okay, here's, I think the fun part, what did we find? Um, first, this is just a, a slide um, that has a lot of information about the um, sample characteristics. So um, you're looking at the demographic characteristics down the rows here, and then, um, in the columns, we have uh, the characteristics for Philadelphia, Seattle, and San Francisco. Um, and just, you know, I'll quickly summarize um, what uh, some of the demographic comparisons will tell you is that um, in Philadelphia um, tends to have a higher proportion of people with lower incomes as compared to uh, Seattle and San Francisco. Um, the racial composition in these three cities is also uh, fairly different um, with the proportion of the population who's non-Hispanic Black being higher in Philadelphia um, compared to Seattle or San Francisco um, and some other population characteristics also varying in these three places. All of our analyses look at these um, three places separately, so we're not assuming that these places are, are similar in, in the work that we're doing on the, on the next slides. Um, so the next result is just really looking at what people paid in the tax on a yearly basis um, and whether this differed by income. Um, so I'm showing you here 
the estimated amount of dollars paid um, per person um, in for, by income in each of these cities. So if we take a look at Philadelphia, our estimates indicate that for the lowest income um, individuals or families, uh, on average, people pay $31 um, in uh, sugar sweetened beverage tax in a year, so annually. Um, this doesn't differ substantially from middle income groups, um, and it doesn't differ statistically, um, and some could argue substantially for the highest income group either. Um, so it varies from 31 in the lowest income group to 27 in the highest income group, um, so fairly similar. If we move over to San Francisco, we see kind of surprisingly that the lowest income group after the tax pays $5.50 in tax per year. And this compares to $9, approximately $9. So a larger amount for the highest income group in San Francisco. And then lastly, Seattle, we found that on average, um, the lowest income group paid $19 a year in, uh, in sugar sweetened beverage tax. Um, and this compared to about $12 a year for the highest income group. Um, so this is kind of the direction that we might expect based on consumption, consumption trends with higher income populations looking like they might be spending on average more. However, um, you can tell by these confidence intervals that overlap that there's a lot of variation in these populations and that these are not statistically significantly different. So on average, we can't say in any of these places that the absolute amount of tax paid varies by income. Um, however, you know, proportion paid as a, as a proportion of income in all three places um, is higher as a proportion of income for lower income populations compared to higher income populations. And this is expected if people are spending approximately the same in absolute dollars, but have a different denominator for their income, they would be paying more as a proportion of income. Now, in terms of the tax revenues, um, these three places raised you know, different amounts of tax revenues. Um, Philadelphia raising the largest amount $75 million collected in the first full year of the tax from the tax revenues. Um, Seattle had about $22 million raised and San Francisco had about $13 million raised. And you can see a little bit more detail in terms of how these places decided to spend the big buckets of spending for each of these three places. So Philadelphia really targeted um, community schools in high poverty neighborhoods. Um, preschools for children living in poverty and rebuilding some communities' um, uh, neighborhood infrastructure. Um, in Seattle, the spending was on some early childhood learning and development, but a lot of the spending was specifically on healthy food access for lower income communities. And then San Francisco was, um, they, they chose sort of a, a combination of food and physical activity grants to give out um, to a variety of organizations. Um, now, when we uh, calculate, um, sorry, this is just one more slide that I might skip over right now um, so that we have time for questions. Um, so when we calculate the amount of revenue collected from each income group, um, lower income compared to higher income for each of these cities, um, we found that in each of these places, if you just look at the um, right here, the total revenue collected, um, it was most similar for Philadelphia, where um, still the higher income population um, paid more in total tax revenue compared to the lower income population, but it, this is pretty close. Um, nevertheless, because a, so much of the programming, 70% of it was specifically targeted towards populations with lower incomes, um, this meant that $52 million of the total was targeted towards uh, populations with lower incomes in Philadelphia, resulting in a large net transfer of uh, $16 million in meaning that um, lower income populations um, uh, sort of received 16 more, 16 million more dollars in uh, targeted program funds than was paid into the tax in aggregate. Um, in Seattle, 
um, you can see the numbers here where it, we estimate that the that populations with lower incomes paid six million dollars in in uh, taxes on aggregate um, compared to 16 million from uh, populations with slightly higher incomes. And the net transfer here, when we look at the spending, 56% uh, of which was targeted specifically towards lower income populations, we see a net transfer of roughly $6 million towards populations with lower incomes. And then San Francisco, the calculation is the same, but again, this, this number derives from the, the fact that the lower income population um, pays roughly $2 million in tax revenue um, derives from the fact that there are fewer lower income uh, people living in, in San Francisco and that they were paying on average, a, um, sort of the point estimate was a lower average amount in tax than higher income populations, resulting in a $5 million net transfer towards lower income populations when considering the, the targeting of the programming. Um, so just sort of to uh, summarize what I just said, um, in all three of these places, when we do these calculations that account for sort of the average amount spent, the distribution of high and low income populations in each of these cities, and then the uh, the way that the the funds are spent in each city. So we see a sizable net transfer towards um, lower income populations through the programming. Just wanted to spend a couple minutes um, pointing out some of the specific ways that these funds have been used in Seattle. And again, I think the approach taken by Seattle was to really try to um, focus on funding um, easier access to healthy foods for populations um, that have traditionally experienced uh, more resource constraints um, and kind of inequitable uh, food system factors. Um, but again, the emphasis on healthy food access is, I think, a little you know unique to what Seattle did. Um, lot, uh, a large proportion of the funds went into a program called Fresh Bucks, which I think was um, highlighted in one of the readings that you did for today. This program provides uh, $40 uh, a month to be used for uh, fruits and vegetables at Safeway or at farmer's markets. They additionally fund um, um, access to early education as well as access to uh, fruits and vegetables in early education and in schools. Um, through the sugar, sweetened beverage tax revenues. Um, so to recap, um, what we found using actual data from post-tax spending in these places is that we didn't find any statistically significant differences in absolute spending um, on the tax by income. And this is kind of a new contribution. We did not know how this would play out before we empirically investigated this. We did find the expected gradient in the percent of um, income, uh, percent of tax paid as a uh, proportion of income. And um, we found a redistributed effect, redistributive effect where we found positive net transfers of revenues paid by higher income populations towards uh, programs targeting lower income populations in all three of these cities. So I'm gonna stop there and hopefully uh, be able to answer questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Jesse. I think we can give, yes. I hope you can hear that. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was such a fascinating presentation. I'm gonna stand where I think you'll be able to see me at least, so you don't feel like you're totally speaking into the void. But we are all looking up at you and um, we're ready to, hear your questions from the crowd. Um, and I also have one if people need a moment to gather their thoughts, but I wanna give the students the floor first. Yes, there is a question. And do you mind, Mar? Well, see if we can. And I'll just repeat the question after the student says it, Jesse, just for the recording. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a really great presentation and um, I think very promising uh, um, as well. So perhaps it's not more about... Oh, I don't know what's happening. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> we'll try that again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 
go ahead. So I just wanted to ask you, you talked about uh, the recommended um, amount of sugar that people should consume. So my question is, uh, what is a practical and easy way to calculate this um, quantity of sugar that we have to eat daily, to not overeat? And how can we use um, uh, like uh, all those lab labels in the, um, in the food that we buy in the shops, just to be sure that we um, again just don't uh, get um, uh, too much calories. Thank you for that question. And so Jesse, I don't know if you heard it, but just to recap, the question was about how um, the daily recommended limits on sugar are calculated and how we as consumers can use nutrition labels to help guide our decision making around sugar. Yeah, that's a really good, um, really good question. Um, so the recommendation from the dietary guidelines is to not exceed 10% of our total calories um, in added sugar each day. Um, in terms of labeling, now uh, added sugars are required to be part of the sort of newer nutrition facts label, as far as I know. And so added sugars should be shown on a separate line. And then what they're calculated as a percentage, so we're trying to, you know, be less than 10% of our total calories, for those labels for simplicity's sake, um, they use a base calorie amount of 2,000 calories a day, which is not everybody's, um, you know, sort of exact calorie limit, it might be more than many people need, might be less than people need, but it gives you a rough sense if the added sugar in a particular um product is, you know, way less than 10% of uh, the, the calories per day. That's helpful. Um, and I think that turns out to be like 19 grams or something like that on, on average of sugar that a uh, person requiring 2000 calories would be aiming for. Another thing is that, you know, you talked about uh, maybe pictures and labels, many countries, especially in Latin America, have been kind of leading the way on front of package labeling, where they are working on ways to classify foods as high sugar, high in added sugar, and put it right on the front of the pack that says, you know, warning, like this is a, like a, a higher sugar food. Um, and thresholds have to be decided for uh, on that, that are basically just, you know, potentially a little bit blunt, but at least help consumers recognize um, the what might be hidden sugar in many foods. Thank you for that question. Yes, we have another question coming from the back. Mara's getting her steps in. <laughs> uh, just going off the label, I didn't really think about this, but when we go to the grocery store, most of us send Thank you so much for that question. I'm going to try to recap quickly. So how is messaging about the, sh uh, the SSB tax shared in grocery stores? Is it, are consumers aware of it? How are they using that additional tax uh, information to make their decisions about purchases? Yeah, great questions. Um, so the tax formulated as an excise tax, the idea was that it should be reflected in the shelf price. So many grocers in Seattle uh, just increased the, sh the shelf price of the beverage. So you look at your Coke and you look at your Diet Coke and you look at your water and all of a sudden after January 1st, 2018, the Coke is going, the sugar sweetened version is going to be more expensive than the Diet Coke that doesn't have um, added sugar in it. Um, and so consumers would recognize the price difference was the goal. Um, many stores put up signage about this, and we've done some studies of the signage, and they, they did this in different ways. So many stores call out the tax right on the price tag. So they say, like, this is not, they're, a lot of the signs say, like, this is not the store's fault. Like, basically, the city of Seattle is, like, 
implementing this tax and now your beverage is going to cost you know however many cents more um there are a few stores in seattle the kroger's actually that continue to just add the tax at the register and that is like it's not completely illegal but it's not how the tax was supposed to have been rolled out. We did do a study of norms and attitudes in, in the city of Seattle. And I think we found that of the people we uh, surveyed, I think something like 90% were aware of the tax. So, you know, at least when the tax first happened, there was really high awareness of the tax. Thank you so much, Jesse. I know you all are gonna have additional questions. Please put them in your seminar summaries and we will share those questions with Dr. Joan Smith, just so she can see what was on your mind after this presentation. Let's give one more round of applause. Thank you so very much. Thanks for having me. My have pleasure. A, thank you. And have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next week. Jesse, I